<clears throat> our series on, on family called The Theology of Family. And today we're gonna talk about parenting, okay? So all the parents in the room, take a big deep breath. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have a good time. And of course, you know, we can't, <clears throat> this isn't a seminar, it's one, it's one message. So what we're going to do, same as last week with marriage, we're going we're gonna to try and just hit some of the most important things that we think are important for parenting these days. We're going to go back and forth a little bit and, and um, we're going to put last week's marriage message to the test <laughs> as we go back and forth and try not to go over the clock. So God's going to help us. Would you pray for us today? Father, we thank you today, God. I thank you for every parent that's in this room that's watching us online, God. Father, I pray that today, Jesus, it, it, there would be no condemnation or feeling of heaviness, but actually hope planted, Lord, that your word can give us tools, Jesus, to raise our children, God, to serve you all the days of their life. God, so I just pray today that you would just plant seeds in every heart, God, and even those that are not parents yet, uh, God, that there would be seeds planted in their hearts, God, as to the word of God applying to every season, every part of our lives, God. So we just thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kaylee. Okay, well, the theology of family. So just a little bit of a review. Uh, the first week we talked about, uh, we talked about how family uh, and community existed before any of us existed. We talked about how in heaven there's this idea of community. But let's go through just a couple of things, the, the last two weeks specifically. Number one, two weeks ago we did the theology of singlehood. Can all of the single people in the house say amen? Come on. Okay? Uh, the theology of singlehood means this. You are not a half person, right? Right. Come on, you are a whole son and a whole daughter of God, created by God to live with purpose in God's missional community. And we talked about how if you can be, if you can find God and live God as a whole person when you're single, that's the key to marriage. That's how you have a healthy marriage because you're never gonna find your fulfillment in your spouse. You're gonna find your fulfillment in Jesus. And so you wanna be two whole people coming together if you get married, not two halves. That's not really the way it's supposed to work. And then last week we talked about the theology of marriage, that marriage is a representation of God's covenant with his people. Remember, it's not a contract with ifs, but it's, it's a covenant. covenant. It illustrates God's inability to break his promise of love and relationship to his people, the bride. Right. So covenant, <clears throat> covenant is a, uh, contracts are selfish. In other words, I'm, I'm protecting myself by doing a contract with you. A covenant is a giving, selfless thing. And it says, no matter what I'm going through, I'm doing this for you. It's, that's how Jesus works. He does it for us. It's a, it's a covenant thing. And today we're going to talk about the theology of parenting. Parents are the imperfect. Every parent say, that's me. <laughs> Both hands raised. <laughs> you got it? Okay. All the parents. I'm going to start over. And then when I say imperfect, all of you are going to shout, that's me. Because I know you feel that differently. Parents are the imperfect That's me. representatives of a perfect father, right? Providing, protecting, teaching, and loving children in an atmosphere of grace and forgiveness. And so we are simply the imperfect representation of what God the Father is to us. And uh, he's, the perfect, he's the perfect parent, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But that's, that's what we mean by the theology of parenting, is that parents are the imperfect representation of a perfect father. Now, we tried to find a couple of, a couple of quotes. Some of them weren't funny. We're going to do our best. Ready? Go. Motherhood is an extreme sport. That's why we have to wear workout clothes every day. <laughs> I'm just telling you yes. right now. <laughs> that costs excuse. money. Hey, they got to be cute the workout, workout clothes. I'm just that, saying. All the, all the <laughs> spouses in here are like, yeah, that costs money. Okay. Uh, my daughter was wearing a flannel hoodie. So I said, hey, the 90s called, and they want their hoodie back. And she replied, yeah, that's because they couldn't text. <laughs> and you know what? When did my kids start owning me? That's my question, okay? <laughs> I love this one. I couldn't decide if I wanted bangs or not, so I cut bangs for my daughter, and she looks awful. Dodged a bullet there. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, that's There horrible. is a that's subtle so truth with some of you moms. You know it. We've... <laughs> We've had some funny stories. Sometimes I like to mess with my family and I like to hide their stuff where they can't find it. Like I put their shoes in the shoe closet and their jacket <laughs> on a hanger. 
seriously. <laughs> Grandmas be like, I'm gonna stay for a few days and reset your children back to factory settings. That's what grandmas do. They, they, they reset, they reset it. Um, uh, I just had uh, my, my five-year-old walk down the stairs with a bucket over his head. So I think we can stop saving for college. <laughs> I don't even know that. Go ahead. I let my toddler play with my phone today, so now everything is in Spanish, and I have 100 pictures of his left hand. Right? <laughs> hey, well, me and my son have shared iTunes account for many, many yes. years, and the pictures on my phone, it's like yes. a chicken with a head, or like, you're just like, what is on my yeah, phone? Yeah, we get to see all guys' pictures. <laughs> They're very interesting. Um, so, but, but parenting, there's nothing like it. Obviously, there's all kinds of different parenting scenarios here today. There's, there's married folk, there's a lot of single parents, um, single parents that are here today, both, both moms and dad, and the numbers of single dads in, in the world is actually increasing at a higher rate right now than, than single moms in some demographics, and, and so we understand that. We understand that parenting is a, is a lot of work. Uh, we understand that it can cause a lot of pain. We know that, that sometimes you're gonna wake up in the morning and you're not gonna know what to do, and that's where Jesus comes in. We know, that, we know that sometimes when your children are going through things, you have no idea what to do about it, and you feel lost, and you feel empty. It's a, it's a big job. You know, what do you do when, you're, when your child has a, a medical issue? You know, I was sitting here, and I think we've given over 100, probably a, well over 100 backpacks to children uh, this year already. Children who are going through chemotherapy uh, that are just young, you know, as young as two years old, and they're opening our backpacks, and it's the best part of their day. And you can imagine the hope that that kind of backpack gives to a mom and a dad who don't really know what to do when you hear that your child has cancer, or maybe it's something else. This is a, this, this is a calling. It's not an event. It's something that, that brings out the fatherhood of God in all of us, and it helps us to realize that we are just not perfect. Parenting is just not easy. I, I, I was looking for a, a photograph of our kids this morning to show you. Now, really, this whole message is basically just uh, every story about our children that we could come up with. We actually had to ask them to leave the room because um, we don't want to have to explain it later. But uh, you know, I, I found a picture of our family, and the reason I picked this one just a little bit ago is because it has all the lassets in it. You don't know all the lassets, but this is my long-lost lasset family that I never knew existed. But I want you to notice the three right in the middle. Those are my children. That's Kaylee, the which is also our worship pastor, the bass player this morning with her arms folded. Her arms were always folded, by the way. <laughs> She never unfolded her arms, and, and that smile, if it was the, because I think that was taken on a Blackberry, <laughs> come on, somebody. <laughs> like, if it had better pixels, you would see the look on Tessa's face, which remains, which is, why are you taking my picture, <laughs> right? And then you've got Kai, who looks like he's basically scratching himself in the crotch. <laughs> um, like, why you so there, that I, I never noticed that until right now, I'm sure that, Kai, if you're online today, and, um, there's nothing you can really do about that. Um, those are my three children, and that's my extended family. I never knew they existed until my kids were that age. We found them online. I didn't know that side of my family. And cool story there, but those are all the, all the kids. And my, my point in showing you this is that that was our kids then, but you know who our kids now. And can I just tell you that between that moment and today, there has been a lot of parenting. And there's been a lot of ups and downs. And there's been a lot of failures and victories. But through it all, how many of you know God is faithful if we trust him and we do it uh, his way? Okay. So I'm going to start today. Number one, God is the ultimate parent. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6, the last half of that. Um, is not he your father who created you and who made you and established you? And every single day, I think we just have to get out of bed and say, you know what, God, God made this child. God made us. We have a father in heaven. Is it, wasn't this a part of God's plan? Doesn't he have our children in his heart no matter what we're going through? Like, he is your father. And we need to remember that God has no grandchildren. He just has children. He just has moms and dads. And when we talk about God being the ultimate father, um, one of the theological things we can do is when we just look, I feel like I'm turned too much. Like I keep, 
my, my neck hurts. There we go. Hi. Hi, what's up? Um, that when we talk about fathering and the Father God, when you read the Old Testament, what you realize, if you can take a 10,000 foot picture of it, is God is just fathering Israel. He's fathering his people. If you take, take the entire Old Testament and you put it together, you just, you, all of a sudden you realize one day that God was providing for them, even when they complained about it. Anybody here ever had kids complain about what you provide for them? That's Israel. God protected them when they didn't deserve it. That's grace. That's where we learn about grace, and that's where we learn some of the beautiful stories of how God loved his people even when they turned uh, their back on him. God gave them boundaries even though they didn't obey them. How many of you have ever had that experience with a child? Um, he gave us boundaries, and we don't obey them. And I, I, I think that the, the big picture thought here is that when it comes to parenting, trust the maker, not the method. Trust the maker, not the method. Because the maker, the one who created family, the one who gave us children, the one who knows how to do this the best, he's been doing it for a long time. He's been doing it from the very beginning, and he's still doing it today. Trust the maker. He knows what he's doing. And one of the other key points as we kind of build this foundation of God setting the example of the ultimate father and parent is that the power of a parent's words are real. Yeah. You know, this verse, Proverbs 18, 21, it says, words kill, words give life. They are either poison or fruit right. you choose. And I think it's so important that we remember this, that our words are the seeds that shape our children's world. So we may be casually just talking, complaining, gossiping, but every word that we speak around our kids, and this isn't to like stress you out or bring condemnation because the Lord knows we're not perfect and we're going to make mistakes, but we have to remember that our words are going to shape their world. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, years ago, uh, sorry kids, I love you, my girls, and Kai's not here to defend himself, awesome. Uh, but, He's you scratching know, his crotch in Nashville. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. We will have words late, later, so you can pray for our marriage. Like of all the pictures, I turn around. <laughs> Anyways. Babe, <laughs> uh, but you know, clock. people know, you know, my daughter Kaylee as maybe the strong one. And you know, because she's been out in front, she's an eight on the Enneagram, whatever. But if you want to know a little secret in her family, there might be one that's a little more stubborn than all of them, and it is my middle child, Tessa. And I remember when uh, she was about three years old and she was being so stubborn. And I literally, in front of a couple people that were close yeah. friends, but kind of like family and a, kind of an uncle and aunt to these guys, I was like, oh my goodness, you are so stubborn, you know? You guys have no idea. <laughs> And it was a quiet stubbornness. Do, does anybody have children like that? It's a, it's a quiet, I'm standing up on the inside. I will comply, but let me tell you, I'm really not. Um, but it was interesting because he pulled me aside later. And I'll never forget it. He said, be careful what words that you just spoke over your child. Because you're going to shape how they see themselves. You're going to shape. So, you know, we just say, oh, they're such a troublemaker. But we have to speak words of life. In fact, I had to change my language to her being stubborn, saying things like, there's a strength inside you that God wants to shape because God wants to use that will. God wants to use that strength. Right. But here's how we got to shape it. So these words, we have to remember. I want to say one of the things is that we can't talk negatively about everybody in the world and we're talking about our friend and we think we're on the phone I'm telling you kids have ears from the other side of the house kids and you think they don't hear you and then all of a sudden you see something reproduced in how they're talking about their friend at school we are shaping their worldview we are shaping how they think how they see things from a very very young yeah. age so our words are very important and it's also one of the greatest challenges Moms and dads, have you ever been just frustrated and you said something in front of your kids and then you regretted it a little later? We all have. But words are so vitally important because like she said, it does shape their world. From a church perspective, our kids, now how many of you know that there's this thing called church drama? Have any of you ever heard of that? <laughs> no, have you heard of church drama? 
Anybody ever been in a church and there was some drama? I mean, our church has never had it, so it's, it's a foreign concept to us. But through, through life, people get hurt in church. Now, I don't wanna talk about that today because I have my own philosophy and I think a theology on that. But you know what, when Donna and I have had our, our greatest struggles in church, our kids have never heard us talk negatively in our home about the people we were frustrated or the people who, who hurt us or pastors and leaders that we were frustrated with. You know what, we honored our leaders all through their early childhood, even when we were frustrated or upset, they never heard us. Now, it wasn't until they figured out that we weren't telling them the whole story. It starts at about 12 years old. Kelly just woke up one day and she's like, that didn't make sense. And I was like, go away. <laughs> but then what happens is, is that, that children, as they grow, they're able to assimilate things at different stages of maturity. So you don't wanna to talk to your children or say things to your children at a time when they can't by maturity, their level of maturity assimilate it. You don't want them to carry things that they're not supposed to carry. Like if they're five, eight, nine years old, they're not supposed to carry the weight of some of the things that you feel about other people. And what happens is that if you do that, they grow up thinking that, that God is good and that people love each other. And then when they decide one day, wait a minute, there's struggle, they're at a time in their life when they can figure it out and they can go to Jesus and they understand it. Another thing that Donna and I have done our whole life, and we could throw these in here, we didn't talk about this, but the words are very important. Every single day of our children's life, every day since the day they were born, there's really two things that we've said to them every day. The first thing that we say to them every day in almost every situation is we love you, we're proud of you, and we believe in you. And we've said it to them well over 10,000, 20,000 times, even in the middle of discipline, even in the middle of a frustrating time when there's tears and, and we're all frustrated, we'll just stop sometimes when they were little and would say, listen to me, Tessa, we love you, we're proud of you, and we believe in you. And you know what happened? Do that for 15, 16, 17 years, the kids actually grow up one day and they go, no, my parents love us, they're proud of us, and they believe in us. The other thing that we did with our words is we made sure that we had words that were consistent over all the other words, things that they would remember. When we would let our kids, I've told this story, I have a message around it, I'll preach it again someday, but we would always say to our kids, um, remember who you are. You remember I preached this a, a few months ago, but the idea was you're a child of God, you're a son of God, you're a woman of God, you're a man of God. And so every day when they would get out of the car to go to class, we would say to them, remember who you are today. And that wasn't a works thing, it was a declaration. God has a plan for you, you know? And, and along with that, you know, as we spoke those words, remember who you are, we would follow it by saying, who are you? And they would say, I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. Because again, they're now speaking life over their own lives and it shapes how they walk into the world. You know? yeah. And then just one last thing on, on the, the, the test, on the Tessa thing, our most rebellious child <laughs> is that, is that if, you, if you know her now, she's actually kind of the strength of our family in many ways. She's the strong one. And, and when, when, she, when she would be stubborn, and by the way, all three of them were stubborn, okay? It's not like I had two angels, you know, and one fallen. <laughs> they were all three. But Tessa's strength, she knows it. She knows she was strong. But you know what? You know what? Because we were able to shape that in a way where we knew that God had a, a plan for that. Now she's a strength to us. And now in the church, she works in the church. She's a strength to the church. She's strong for the staff. And she does all these other cool stuff. And let me leave you with this thought on this one. Speak words to them that come from how you see their future, not how you are relating to them in the present. Yeah. Speak things that are about their future over their life every single day. Yeah. Another thing we like to talk about is discipling your children. Now again, these are just big topics. We can't get into like deeper stuff here, but, but disciple your children. Your children are your first disciples. Your children have been given to you. They are your responsibility. As a matter of fact, um, when, when we have a child, uh, having a child is the most God-like attribute that has been given to humanity by God. You have the ability to bring an eternal soul, an eternal spirit that will live in heaven for all of eternity with God. You get to bring one of those into the world. And so when we look at our child, we have to think, how has God raised me? How does he shape me? How does he disciple me? And it's your responsibility to disciple your child. Proverbs 22, verse six. Start children off on the way they should go. 
And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Go ahead. Uh, you know, one of the keys on this is is shaping their heart. You know, when my kids were little, um, I was kind of like trying to figure this whole thing out, and I would read this book and ask quite, and, and honestly, you would read this book, and it would tell you to do this. You'd read book this book, and it would tell you to this, and you'd be kind of confused. And we started, you know, my mind started focusing on their behavior. But I read this this, you know, these verses, and it's like when we shape a child's heart, not their behavior, everything changes. You know, it's like there's that saying where it's like, give someone fish and they can eat for a day, but teach someone to fish and they they can be fed for a lifetime. If we just modify their behavior all the time, do this, don't do that, they may fix certain things, but if we can shape their heart, then all of the things that are going to happen in their life, if their heart is soft before God, if they're teachable, if they're moldable, if they've learned how to listen to the Holy Spirit, if they've learned godly correction, those kind of things, we're shaping a heart, not just behaviors. I want to challenge you on that. It's easier to just correct behavior, but it doesn't do the work that shaping their heart. You know, uh, Kaylee, when she was uh, little, uh, she could out challenge me at four. So, you know, she'd, I'd hand her a blue sippy cup and she'd be like, mm, no, I want the red sippy cup. And I'd be like, no, you're going to get the blue sippy cup. No, I want the red sippy cup. Here's why. Because Monday you gave me the blue one. Tuesday, you, I mean, and honestly, before I, just, I knew it, I'm confused. Just, what did we say? Fine, have the red cup. Because <laughs> you're going to yeah. tell the story, right? Yeah. I just had a memory, though. Yeah. It, well, this memory that you have wasn't just, because that was part of it. Do you remember? She kept picking on Tessa. Yes. Well, there was that too. <laughs> and she was being really mean to Tessa every day. And we didn't know how to deal with it, right? Yep. And then mm-hmm. it led to a moment. So, you know, we kept just for a season, and I wish I could tell you it was just a conversation and boom, you know, but as a four-year-old, it took a season of us really talking about her heart, really talking about her heart. And uh, it was it was challenging. And then this moment happened where Doug was in her bedroom and was telling her a Bible story, actually about Nicodemus of all stories. And literally, she just all of a sudden was like, I want Jesus in my heart. And they had this beautiful moment. And you know what happened? We went from having to go like this constantly to there being a softness in her heart. And it it was like, whoa. As a four-year-old, we watched her behavior Change so quickly in a way that we could actually uh, speak into her heart. Um, so we were at a restaurant one day, uh, very shortly after that this week, the week it happened, and she was just honestly behaving beautifully. We're in a restaurant, and the waiter comes up to her and, sa- and says, wow, you, ha- you are so well-behaved and well-mannered. And she literally looks at this waiter and says, she was like four. Yeah. I gave my heart to Jesus this week, and everything changed. <laughs> what was her answer? Everything changed. My whole life changed. That's what she said. My whole life changed. And the waiter goes, well, maybe I need that. <laughs> and so we're like, yeah. you know. So just an encouragement. Just yeah. keep at it. Keep after their heart, and yeah. don't get discouraged. Yeah. Um, so, so shape the heart. Remember that it's about the heart, because if you can shape the heart, the behavior will follow. But that doesn't mean that there's not boundaries, and we all know that, because God put boundaries in, in everything, and those boundaries are there to protect us, and we, we, we understand that. Um, and I, I have more to say about boundaries, but for time, I want to just, under this same idea that we're discipling our kids, I want to bring up something that I think is very apropos to the season that we're in. And that is that it is the, now this is a daunting job, but it is the parent's job to disciple the child. It's not the government's. Now listen, when I say government, everybody everybody gets political. They have a political twinge that just goes, you know, where's he going? What what I'm saying is, is that one of the great conversations that we've had 500 times is, do I homeschool my kid? Do I parent my, do I, or do I public school my kid or do I Christian school my kid? And parents will go through anguish trying to make this decision. But the idea is that there is no school of any kind, even a Christian school, that can disciple your child the way that you can. It's the parent's job. 
It's not the parents. And, and we, we did it with Christian schools. And what, what would happen is, is that parents would come to us. Uh, well, we had hundreds and hundreds of Christian school kids and hundreds of homeschool kids as well. But parents would come to us and they would be dying to get their kid into a Christian school, into our Christian school, because they just knew that if they got their kid in our Christian school, that everything was going to be okay. And so the kid would come to the Christian school and guess what? Everything wasn't okay. Now that it was just not okay in a Christian school. And the reason was because that they had relegated the responsibility of discipling their children to a school, a teacher, a principal, a public school, a government, a city, and they, have, they somehow lost that, that passionate responsibility. I don't care where you put your kids, I don't. And it is harder today, I gotta be honest, it is harder today. So I'm just gonna be really honest with you and I, I'm not trying to be political at all, I just want you to know it's harder today. We were youth, minister, youth pastors for almost 20 years. We've done it all, you guys. 20 years is way too long to be a youth pastor. We're still in therapy, okay? Like it's way too long, but we have done it all. Um, when, when we were youth pastors, it was the, the peer pressure was from a peer. It was the peer. And it was our greatest thing was the peer. Like peer pressure, here's how you handle it. By the way, it's still an issue. But now the pressure is from the teacher, it's not from the peer. The pressure now is from the culture, from the school, and from the teachers. And you're going to have to navigate that because Doug and Donna are not going to give you the answers for that. We're not going to stand up here and preach one thing or the other. And we're not, we're not political people by nature because our, our dominant gift is pastoral, right? It's just we're pastors. We just love everybody. We hug everybody. We give everybody our money. You know what I mean? It's like, here. We just, we just love you. But, but I just want you to understand that we understand that it is different today, but even in a culture like what we're in today, the responsibility is still on the parent. Yep. Yep. And so you have to make a decision for your child what you want to do. That's your decision. You have to know each child. Yep. Because we almost switched our schooling situation with our kids 10 times. Mm -hmm. Like one day we woke up, we looked at Kai, and we're like, Kai, I think you're going to be homeschooled. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Mom and Dad. <laughs> I will die. <laughs> That's what he said, didn't he? Yeah. He goes, I will die. Yes. I said, but son, <laughs> the, the, your social pressure that you're feeling from your friends because you're, you're, you know, your your personality, you love everybody, it, that's working against you right now. And so we need, we need to spend time with you. We want to read the Bible with you. We want to pray with you. We want to talk about what's going on with your friends. And we did. That's why all the kids love to be at our house because we, we just... We just talked to them over and over. And when Kai graduated, he had all of his friends over for his graduation party. And do you, you know what this resulted in? I'm out in, the, I'm out in the driveway trying to say goodbye after the graduation. All his friends from school are there. Kai walks out with like eight or nine guys. And some of you, some of you teenagers were there. And there's like eight guys there. And, and Kai goes, hey, dad, come here. So I walk up in the driveway and he points at this one guy. He goes, hey, dad, this guy here, he's got some questions about his future. And all of these guys need some help figuring out like who God is. Can you just talk to them for a little while while I go back into the party? <laughs> so here's what happened. Those, those hour upon hour, hour after hour after hour of conversations, discipling those children and not relegating that to anybody else, it turned into a moment where I got to stand in the driveway a few years later and minister to, about, to all of his friends about Jesus and talk to them about what they should do with their life and what college they should go to and why and what are influences, bad influences, good. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I'm thinking my time with my son has now resulted in time with his friends. And so there's, there's a very powerful principle here, moms and dads. Yeah. Remember, God has your back. Okay. I think on that, just listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Lord can teach you, and every kid is different, and every year could be different. So don't lock into a certain way as that is your conviction. This is not going to be able to be that way. This is going to have to be like the Holy Spirit speaking to right. you year by year. Right. So, so let me leave, it, leave, leave you with this. Parenting, when it comes to discipleship, Parenting is not a competition with the world. It is putting the world on notice that your child has a purpose. And we're not going to relegate that to anybody else. That's right. Okay? Then we have the power of time. 
Uh, Psalms 127.3, it says, don't you see, and we read this this morning, that children are God's best gift, the fruit of the womb, his generous legacy. You know, quality time comes out of quantity time. So you can't just decide, oh, we're going to spend a quality hour with my kid and that's going to make up for the whole week because it doesn't work that way, especially certain kids. They, they need some quantity time. And I want to just speak into this. I hear in culture today a lot of a parenting that just complains about your children, that parenting is so hard, and, and it is. Trust me, it is, and it is a full-time job, and I get that. But they are a gift from the Lord. They are a heritage. They're our reward. And so I, I want to say this. They should be your priority over your social clubs, over all of the things that you could do, that your kids, we got to make time with them a priority because quality time is going to come out of quantity time. My parents said it all the time to me. This moment, you never know when that moment's going to happen where you're just like all of a sudden they ask a question or all of a sudden they're honest with you. And I'll say this, the time you're putting in in their young years sets you up for the teenage moments where they need you and now they have a relationship with you and you talk about everything and so it's no different as they get there. Uh, so quality time, we can't just playing on that. We have to give our time to our kids. And I want us to set a culture where we're not complaining about that, where we're celebrating the fact that we have young children that do make us exhausted. But aren't we so grateful that God has given them as gifts to us? Yeah, they are a gift. And, um, you know, on, on our staff, we have a lot of young children on our staff. I mean, sometimes our, our staff meetings are like romper room. It's like, it's like, oh, let's, let's, let's change the world. And like, I gotta change the diaper first. I'll be, you know, it's like, oh, okay, you know? And, but you're never gonna hear Doug and Donna in a staff meeting going, you know what, can you just get your kids out of here? Hey, can you, can you do me a favor and just don't bring your, bring your kids here? We, we don't function that way because our staff children are gifts to the church. They're gifts to the church. We love them, we care for them, and, and we, we don't want the church or our world to ever set a precedent in their heart that, that uh, mom and dad's job was so important that we were, we were um, taking their time away from their parents or, or when we ask for extra sacrifices that, that the kids don't matter. I'm telling you right now, our staff kids, we love them, we treat them as if they were a gift to the church. And it has an impact. You know, that time thing is really important too. I just come back to that for a second. Um, one of the things that we did, and this is for somebody in here, I don't know, um, but when you do vacations, everybody loves to do vacations with friends. And I understand that. But we had uh, someone tell us years ago, he looked at us in the face and he said, whatever you do, make sure no matter how much time you spend with your friends, that you have some time on vacation whatever that means to you, alone with your kids. Because the only thing you cannot get back is time. And once it's gone, once they're that little, those little kids in that picture and then we wake up and we're dropping them off at college, you look back and the first thing that you assess, because this is what we did, the first thing we, we assessed as Kai walked into his little house with the other students, the first thing was, how much time did we spend with him? Did we get, can, we can't get it back because now it goes the other direction. Yeah. Now it goes the other way. Now we'll get less and less as time goes by. So the only thing you can't get back. So take your vacations, take a portion of that of time in your year where you spend it only with your kids, not with your best friends, not with extended family, with you and your children. You know, that time leads to relationship. And I grew up, you know, my mom and dad are here and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I had a very, maybe you would call it a strict home. And we had a lot of rules, and I and I, I didn't rebel. And and people would ask me like, why don't you fight against that? Like that's re you know whatever coming from their mindset. And I had such a deep relationship with my mom and dad, even though they were a ministry family, and I was at the church a lot. But because we had such a deep relationship, I didn't want to hurt my parents. I wanted to honor my parents. And you know, I want to say this to you who are children right now in this room and teenagers. Do you know that on, it says, honor your mother and father and you will be blessed. It's one of the promises that God's, it's one of the directions that God gives us that equals a blessing. 
blessing, that as you honor your parents, that there will be a blessing upon your life. So whether it's rules, whatever the things you don't understand, I want to encourage you. This is a time to honor, even if it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. Honor, and there will be a blessing. But really, that this is the final statement with this. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. But see, when there's relationship, those kind of boundaries are what, what you feel loved by. The Bible also says that if you don't honor your mom and dad, that ravens will come and, and peck your eyes out. There's also that verse. Oh. So, young people, I want to leave you with that today um, as a point of encouragement. All right, love you. All right, next is discipline is a form of love. So Proverbs 3, verses 12 says, Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father the son he delights in. See, discipline in culture today, and I want to speak into this for a minute, is discipline is almost like this bad word. It's because it maybe there has been abuse or there's been things that have been done improperly or in anger, and I get that. But I can tell you this, the Bible is right. And the Bible speaks that discipline, when you are disciplined, it's because God loves us. When your parents and you discipline your kids, when you're doing it in a godly way, it isn't because you're a bad parent. It's because you love your children. And we have people running all over the place that were never disciplined. And they view that as being toxic or abuse. Can I tell you, it's not when it's done in a godly way. There's Bible verses, and I want to speak to this in culture. I'm going to read you some. This is Bible. This isn't Donna Lass's version. This is the Bible. Proverbs 22, 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. I'm going to brush on this because I don't want to off a bomb, but we spanked our kids in a godly way, in a loving way, never leaving a mark, never leaving a bruise, and never out of anger, but we would literally discipline our kids in that way because that's what the Bible talks about, but we would talk about it, and then we would literally pray with them, and do you know what the response of godly discipline is? Is love. My kids would come and cling to me and hug us, and joy came out of it when it was done in a godly way. But see, it takes more time that way. It's easier to just be like, go sit in a corner, go sit on a stair, go do this, take a time out. And there's times that that's appropriate. I'm talking about the big things. And we had some big things, lying, disrespect, disobedience. And they always, that consistent discipline trained our children that those were behaviors that were going to lead to pain. But see, in culture today, if we talk about that, it immediately goes to abuse. And I'm sorry if in any way you grew up with that kind of discipline. But I want to say you as a parent can do it in a godly way. It takes so much more time. It takes so much more effort. But again, you can shape a child's heart as they grow. And you will be so thankful later. Uh, So obviously there's different situations where there has been abuse, where you have to be careful. And I, and I get all that, but we can't react. Here's another verse, Proverbs 29, 15, discipline is critical for wisdom and a child who obeys his parents will be wise. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates their children. So there's this thing where God shows us how many have been disciplined by God. How many have had something where it's like, Ooh, I feel like God just kind of, whoo, that shows that God loves us. And we as parents can model that same level of love for children. We even talked before the service. Do we even talk about that in in the service today? Because certain things that are biblical, and you know how this works, right? Certain things that are biblical become political, and you don't want to say anything because you're afraid that you're going to get, you know, a a Facebook or a a tweet or whatever. And But the the point here is, also, we didn't want to talk about maybe this one because we can say, do it in a godly way, but for us to not take another 15 minutes to explain what we mean by that, to actually equip parents to do that. There's not time for that this morning. But the point is, is that God disciplines those that he loves. And and there is something, I mean, people would ask us, hey, how'd your children get, I mean, our children are not perfect. And the more you know them, they're not perfect. But, you know, how did did they get like that? Well, part of it was that we had a very godly, biblical system of discipline in our home and by the time those kids were eight or nine years old, they never, they never needed another spank. And that might sound crazy to you, but I'm just telling you that when we were shaping them when they were younger, 
as they got older, we had this culture in our house where they just wanted to obey. They just had this relationship thing, all except for Tessa, but you know, it's, it's okay. Poor Tessa, um, I love you. Um, we gotta move off that okay, one. Go. Okay, because look. Yes, go Okay. <laughs> oh, this is me? Yeah. Grace is, is demonstrated, not taught. Kids have to see grace in the home. Because what'll happen is sometimes as a parent, you get in these patterns of just disciplining, disciplining, disciplining all the time. And, um, and over long periods of time, if they don't see grace, you know, discipline, discipline, that's why we, we, I, I kind of shouted it next to her, but sometimes like you should never discipline when you're upset. You know, you discipline when, when emotions are over, but, but, but grace also has to be disciplined. And there's seasons of discipline, but when you, when you have a grace inside your heart from Jesus that it's, it's, it's bursting. It's, it's get, wants to get out through you into your children, your children. God wants them to see that we had a, and we preached this years and years ago. I don't even remember when it was, but we did a, we read a book and it was very confusing. We tried some things in the book. This one backfired, yes. but, but one of the things they did was like, try the bowl of consequences. So if you know what that is, it's where you, you put, um, consequences in a bowl when your kids are little, you know, and like a fishbowl. And then every time the kids do something wrong, you know, you go, okay, we're gonna go to the bowl of consequences, you know? <laughs> and you're gonna reach into the bowl and whatever you, you know, it's a kind of little game. They would laugh through it. It's like, oh, you have to do the dishes or, you know, or you have to, you know, clean, you know, clean your room again. I don't know, whatever. There was like a hundred in there, little things. Some of them were funny. But in there was one piece of paper that said grace grace. And so we started doing this and it was working out in the beginning. And Kaylee, this is when she was little. She was, she was pretty little, maybe six, six. I don't even remember. So, and she would reach into the bowl and, you know, she would have to do something, you know, like clean the garage. I don't know. She was six. No, <laughs> whatever. she couldn't watch a movie. Or <laughs> you couldn't watch had... a movie, whatever. So, <laughs> you know, and she, she had like eight or 10 of these, right? And Tessa, then one morning, T Kaylee, after getting all of these disciplines, Tessa got in trouble. I wish I could remember what she did, I, I don't remember. But we all got around the bowl of consequences, the whole family, and Tessa reaches into the bowl. She swishes her hand around. <laughs> pulls it out, you see a big smile come over her face. She turns it around and she goes, Grace. <laughs> Kaylee got so mad. <laughs> she literally yelled. She goes, that is not fair. <laughs> and I said, exactly. <laughs> That's grace. Grace is getting what you, th that forgiveness that you don't deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. It's where you get a, Jesus wipes it. You, you don't have to pay the price for that. Now, the, it backfired because then our children turned into performers. Because we had a good bowl of consequences. We had a good bowl, so, too. Oh, you shared without asking? So oh, you, you yeah. were kind? And then they would be like, get some treat or whatever. Yeah, six years old, you come home, they're in an apron trying to make dinner. <laughs> they're like, you know? did you see me being nice, you know? Mom? <laughs> All of a sudden, it turned, a it turned into performance. We're like, this is not working. <laughs> Because these are not our real children, you know what I mean? Um, but it has to be demonstrated in the home. James chapter 4, verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And parents need to be humble for their children. And um, I want to say something yeah. really quick. Is One of the things that my parents taught me that we've tried to do is that Acknowledging the fact that we're not perfect and we make mistakes and we lose our temper or we yell at our kids or we snap too quickly and didn't hear the whole story or whatever, is that we have to model humility to our kids. And we can do that by saying sorry. We can say, I'm sorry. I, I was not thinking when I did that or I didn't listen or mommy got a little bit upset there and lost my temper. That we are actually showing them that we are also on the path to grow growing and that there's, it's okay, that making a mistake is not the end. Those kind of things show grace to your kids as we model that as parents is living that and not being afraid to say, hey, I, I was wrong too, or 
I messed up. And it gives such, it, it, what it does is in the family is if we lead our family with humility and grace, then we set an atmosphere that is motivated by love and not performance. And that is so key. So leading with grace yeah. and humility is such a key to family. So we're out of time. Yes. Okay. So just, is there any, is there any closing thought? Do you forgive us? I felt your presence behind me and I, I got scared. It's like, is there any, anything else you want to just say? The closing thought is this. I, I feel the oxygen go out of the, the room when I said a couple things on discipline. I want to just say to you, yeah. you listen to the Holy Spirit. If I could say one thing and the one thing that you leave here is God gave you your kids not, they didn't give them to me. They didn't give them to your friends. Mm -hmm. That God is going to teach you what each child needs. God is going to show you. So don't go read a book. Go to your knees. Don't go try to find a blog or even talk to someone that has good children. Because maybe what worked for them doesn't work for your kids. I want to say this. Listen. 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 When God prompts you to walk into your teenager's room and ask them for their phone, Listen, when God prompts you that that child needs some more attention or that child needs some one-on-one -on -one time with you, listen. When you get that prompt that may need some encouragement or that maybe that's not a healthy friend for them or whatever it is, there's not a whole bunch of rules that we can tell you what works for, you, what works for us will work for you. But listen to the Holy Spirit. He's going to guide you and your family on discipline, on love, on time, on all of the things if you could just take that one thing, is please listen to the Holy Spirit. He's going to guide you because he created your kids. And I want you to know this. You are the perfect mom for them. You're not a perfect mom, but you are the perfect mom for that child. Right. You are the perfect dad for that child. So walk in confidence. God picked you. God picked you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you about your kids. And my last thought goes to all the single parents, single moms and dads. Okay, so my mom just passed three weeks ago. You know that. Uh, I was raised by a single mom. Uh, it was not easy, and we had some unique challenges. But my mom trusted God. She was a believer. And, and this is just a little side story. We're going to end right, right here. But I remember one of the stories my mom told me after I told her I had become a Christian because she had backslid and hadn't gone back to church for years. And I came to her and I said, Mom, I'm a Christian. And she just looked at me and started to cry. And she said, Doug, when you were three years old, I looked out the window, you were crawling, crawling around on the grass, you were playing with a friend and a babysitter. And God spoke to me and said that you were gonna be a pastor at three years old. And between that moment and the next, you know, 20, 30 years of single, you know, just single mom, and all the struggles that I went through, um, she had God to turn to. And somehow, by the grace of Jesus, it turned out okay. You know, both for my sister and myself. I, I guess I wanna say this to you, God has your back. You know, single moms, I know how you feel. Some days you wake up and you go, I just need someone to have my back right now. Because there's, there's days when we're struggling with the kids and, and um, Donna will call me. And there's days where I'm struggling. I'm like, Donna, you got to come in here and deal with this. But if you're, if you're a single mom, single dad, there's nobody to turn to. It's just you. And I want you to know that God has your back. Turn to him. It's going to work out. Okay? Can we all stand to our feet? And can you please put your hands together for all the parents in the room, all the moms and dads and whoever you are. I want every parent in the room, every mom and dad, you're in the throes of parenting. I'd like you to, just as we close, I'd like you to lift your hands, both hands up to Jesus, and we're gonna do a closing prayer for you right now. And you're gonna start, go ahead. Father, I thank you for that grace upon yeah. grace, God. I pray that if there is any parent here that maybe has a child that's struggling or not following God, I pray that just your grace would cover their hearts, God. And right now, we pray for every prodigal child, every child that isn't serving you, Lord. I pray that, God, we cling to that verse, that when they are old, they will not depart from it, God. Yeah. So I pray in Jesus' name, God, for grace for every parent, what is on their heart right now in this moment. God, I pray that if they have a burden in, in 
their heart for one of their children right now. God, you see every burden. God, you see today, Jesus. I pray just that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on each parent, that you would speak to them, that you would give them keys to shepherd their child. God, I pray that there would be keys in their, this next week, Jesus, that you would lead yeah. them, that you'd guide them, that we would have faith, that we would hope, that we'd stand on the Word of God, yeah. that our children will go out like arrows, God. Yeah. So we just thank you. I pray for strength. I yeah. pray for grace. I pray for peace, God, on every parent in every season, God. We thank you, Lord. Amen. And Father, we pray for every child in this church. We pray for every infant all yes. the way through our teenagers. Yes. And we just thank you, Father. They are gifts. Yes. They're not a burden. Their gifts. And Father, we lift them up to you. We pray over their life. We pray over their, their hearts, their minds, their spirits. I pray that you would give every parent in this room the ability to shape the heart. I pray, Lord, that you give them a burden and a fresh revelation of how to get into the heart of the child. And I thank you, Father, for your goodness and your grace that is on the moms and dads in this room right now. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would bless them. I pray, Father, that regardless of what struggle they may be having in parenting right now, the Bible says he has your back. I thank you, Father, how you guide us and you lead us. In the mighty name of Jesus, come on. And all God's people shouted amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Amen. Let's just close with a song. God bless you. Come on, see, everything is changing. And everything is changing now. Everything.